when you're trying to achieve greatness in something like music, it's a hard business to win at. There's so many people who want to be in it, and very few who want to put in the work to be the best at it. Um, and so I always say just... Hello and welcome to Talk Back On, episode 17, where we dive into stories from the other side of the studio glass for professionals in K-pop. This is the first and only place where award-winning creators behind K-pop's biggest hits share their experience and knowledge in songwriting, production, and publishing. We have an amazing show today, but before we start, please make sure to follow at Talk Back On on all social media platforms and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content like this. Also, be sure to hit that bell icon to receive notifications on our latest news and giveaways. Lastly, we are partnering with major brands to provide more value to our community, like our favorite plugins from Waves and other sponsors that support our show. So make sure to join our Discord, where you'll find our hosts and star guests hanging out with our incredible community. Now, before we introduce our superstar guest, I'll share my tips on transitions for enhancing production in our latest segment of Circuit Board. Enjoy, and we'll see you guys back here soon. Hey, what's up, guys? It's KO coming at you from a different angle. Today on Circuit Board, we're going to be going over song transitions to better enhance your production. So let's dive right into it. So the session that we have here today is the breakdown intro. If you guys haven't had the chance to watch it, please check it out on the Kairos Music Group YouTube channel. This is where we bring on guest writers and producers to share some cool stuff working behind the scenes with some of your favorite K-pop records. So I have a two track here. Let's check it out without any kind of transitions whatsoever. Cool. So the track in itself, uh, it's, it's pretty good. Um, However, I just feel like there can be a bigger impact right when that beat drops. So there are a couple ways that we can kind of approach this. Obviously, you can be as creative as you want, but it could really depend on what kind of impact that you want to make. Obviously, for a track like this, we want to have a very strong impact and really let it be known that, hey, something big is coming. So the first way we could really look at it is either using risers, sweeps, or even reverse percussion. Now with that, you're actually building up momentum, but there's got to be some sort of release. So what I did was add a riser and then right at the section right here, you'll notice that I've actually cut out the entire beat. So it's a complete empty dead space. So let's check it out and see what else we can add to it. Cool. Definitely builds up a lot more suspense. Now, I what I tried to do is add a tom fill just to give some sort of pickup into the into the drop. So let's check it out with the tom fill. So this definitely keeps the transition going. However, I feel like we could be a little bit more creative and making that transition stronger. So let's check out some other examples. Now in this example, you can see that I've done some stuttering effect on the track itself and even added a snare fill to really further enhance this kind of stutter. So the riser is still there just to build up that suspense once again. But now we're playing around with rhythmic percussive ways to really kind of bring more impact. So let's check this out. This definitely gives me a stronger impact. However, the next example and the final example I'm about to show you is what is actually on the video. So since this track is for a video, we really wanted to build a transition around something that people will know what they're watching. 
So rather than using an instrument or a percussion, we built this track around a vocal tag. So you can see that now with this empty space, we have this vocal tag and we did some creative stuff with it, such as reversing some of the words and stuttering it as well too. And lastly, we added this infamous air horn to really kind of give it a bit more of that impact right before the drop. So let's check out the final result. To simply put it, transitions are kind of like riding a roller coaster. There's that long climb up before the exciting part happens. So in music, find creative ways to really emphasize the transitions before going into a course or a drop, and that will make that part much more memorable. So I'll see you guys next time. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Welcome back. Hope you guys liked our latest circuit board. Let's dive right into our episode because I'm very excited to have our guest today on Talk Back On podcast. First, we have our legend and award-winning producer slash composer who has paved the way for K-pop stars and music, Jay Chong. Woo! Thank you, guys. <laughs> Next is an award-winning multi-platinum producer and songwriter, as well as the CEO of Decade Plus Music Publishing, Kairos. Woo! 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 <laughs> and myself, KO, an audio engineer and director of A&R at Decade Plus Music. Our guest for today probably worked on everyone's favorite records. Uh, he is a Hall of Famer, Grammy Award winning producer, songwriter, engineer, entrepreneur with his own signature line of plugins. He's a brilliant mind behind some of the biggest songs from Beyonce, Jay Z, Kanye West, Dua Lipa, Chainsmokers, Twice, and BTS. Please welcome our guest, DJ Swivel. Woo! Yeah. Well, Thanks for having me. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Awesome. I'm sure a lot of our community members and fans recognize your music and the impact that you're making worldwide. Um, so to kick things off, please tell us about how you got here and the story behind your name, DJ Swivel. Oh, well, that's a loaded question. Um, OK, well, the name I'll, I'll start with the name because that kind of came first before, you know, I really kind of found my my journey um, or my way on my journey. Uh, the name was like, there is a really special story. It's, it's funny. I told this story earlier today, um, but I used to promote, I used, I started as a DJ and I used to promote parties in Toronto where I, where I um, grew up and, you know, I used to get paid $20 to go stand out in the cold at two in the morning and hand out flyers to the people leaving the club for the next week's party. So I did that for a few months uh, for a, a promoter friend, still a friend of mine to this day. And, um, then a few months into it, he said, hey, do you want to DJ the next party? And I said, absolutely, I want to. Uh, and he, he asked, like, what name do you want to have on the flyer? And I didn't really have a DJ name at that point. So I wrote a bunch of names down and I just came up <laughs> with DJ Swivel <laughs> and it seemed like the best one. So not the most creative story, just like it, there was a need to have a name. So I came up with something and then it sort of stuck. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the beginning part of my journey. And, and I was you know, DJing in high school and, and producing in high school and then uh, decided to sort of make it a career. So I, I did a year uh, of school at, at Full Sail and then moved to New York. And uh, I started an internship for a guy named Duro, who um, uh, you may know him for Desert Storm Records. He's a CEO a partner with DJ Clue on Desert Storm Records. They signed a rapper named Fabulous. And I was Duro's intern. Duro's uh, a, a Grammy award-winning producer, engineer, mixer, a and &R. Um, And, uh, you know, he gave me my first shot. He gave me my opportunity to sort of like, you know, could I take the trash out better than everyone else sort of internship, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and within a year, you know, I became fabulous as engineer and started recording him. And I did a couple albums and a few mixtapes with him, toured with him. Uh, and then I met... Uh, you know, someone from Beyonce's team actually through Fabulous. And he called me one day uh, saying that Beyonce needed a fill-in engineer. Her engineer was sick, I guess. Uh, so I came in, I did a, a few days of sessions with her and they seemed to go well. And then she invited me back to, to record her whole album four. Um, so I worked on four with her and um, I had worked with Jay-Z prior to that, you know, through Duro, but 
um, then got to work directly with Jay and, um, you know, we, we were on the road with he and Kanye when they were doing watch the throne. And, uh, that was an amazing learning experience for me, you know, recording and, mi- and mixing her. And then uh, a few years after that, I connected with the group, the chain smokers and, uh, had, had a, a string of uh, hits with them. Uh, Don't let me down. We want a Grammy for it closer, uh, something just like this. Uh, and then through the chain smokers tying this all back, um, they did a song, they produced a song for BTS. This was in 2017. So very early, um, maybe not so early for BTS, but early for the Western world's uh, recognition of, of B. This is well before they were a household name. Uh, and they did a song called Best of Me. And I mixed that. And then through that, I built a relationship with uh, the team over at Big Hit and um, started sending them some of my own records. And then, you know, the rest is history. So they say. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Well, you made such an impact in the K-pop genre with songs like Euphoria. What was the biggest surprise to you transitioning from Western pop to K-pop? You know, it wasn't actually that big of a a shift for me because I had worked across genres. Uh, Like I mentioned, I started with Fabulous and hip hop and Kanye and Jay and that sort of stuff. And then Beyonce and more R&B and pop music and Jay Sean and some of these other, you know, more pop driven artists. And then going into the EDM world, Um, that sort of gave me an opportunity to sort of explore all genres of music and all styles. And, uh, what it's done is it's made me fairly, um, just fairly competent across genres, across styles. Um, I don't feel like I'm one thing as a producer. I feel like if I can hear it and I can see the vision, I can get there. Uh, and so K-pop is just an extension of that. Um, there are of course differences in, certainly from the business standpoint of how the business operates, but even from a band standpoint, I mean, in Western pop, we don't have a lot of bands anymore. And even if we do have a band, it's like maxed out at five people. So um, sometimes the challenge is how do you uh, find room for seven artists in a, in a, in a group like BTS where you have seven members and some K-pop groups have a lot more than that. Um, how do you give every artist an opportunity to shine and, and give them their moment? Cause every artist, if you're, if it's a group song, every artist should have their moment. Um, and I sort of took that challenge actually as creative freedom. Cause a lot of times when we're in songwriting sessions, we, we might have two really good ideas that we love. And then you have to pick one. Cause it's like, well, you can only have one hook. You can't have two hooks. You can only have one or, um, but in K-pop, there's a lot more room for different sections and pieces of the song. So you actually have these uh, a little bit more complexity, I think in, in the songs and in the songwriting. Uh, and so I kind of view that as like freedom. It it allows you to, you don't have to just pick one idea. You can present multiple ideas. The first verse and the second verse don't have to sound similar. They can be totally different and give, it gives room for everybody. So um, I actually, you know, love working you know, in that environment and and felt like it was actually creatively freeing, if anything. Yeah, I love that. You know, it makes us like better songwriters or producers, you know, um, because, um, you know, when there is this kind of open landscape, you have to push your your creativity a bit. And um, but it also has to make sense. You know, we can't just do random stuff, you know. So, um, yeah, I love that. Yeah, this kind of ties into the next question. You you know, you have so many different skill sets from beyond it being Beyonce's personal engineer. Uh, even mixing for Tiesto, producing with Chain Smokers, and even songwriting and singing background vocals for BTS. Uh, how do you approach these different roles and create these opportunities? I'm a bit of an uh, enigma, maybe, when it comes to you know your average songwriter or producer. Uh, mostly, I just get bored very easily, and and I like to do different things. I always like to challenge myself. I'm a perpetually curious person. So I'm always interested in learning more and, and, and under, and having a greater understanding of, of everything really. Um, and so that, that paired with this, you know, maybe, um, this idea of like just knowing better or, 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 or whatnot, it, it kind of forced me in a position where I had to learn how to do all these different things. Cause I would, you know, produce a beat and then I wouldn't have a songwriter to like do a top line on it. So I had to learn how to like 
come up with melodies and it took time and for me to get comfortable wanting to like sing a melody and, and, and song, write. you know, engineering was sort of a foot in the door into the business. Producing was what I really wanted to do. So I was kind of juggling both. And then I actually fell in love with engineering and, and mixing because I found that it complemented my production, learning how to engineer properly and how to mix a record. Well, uh, makes you a better producer. I don't care what anyone says. If you are get to a level where you can mix a record for a, an A-level artist, you will become a better producer just by the fact that you, you trained your ear to that point. Because now it's not just creatively, you're hearing things creatively, but you're also hearing how every drum sample fits in together and how to get the, the perfect sound that you're looking for. Right. Um, so all of these things kind of built off of one another and it didn't all happen overnight. It, started with engineering and then, you know, mixing and more production work. And then I sort of expanded that with songwriting and then, you know, expanded that with actually singing vocals on certain songs and certain artists like the chain smokers gave me a lot of freedom with that. They would, you know, sometimes you're in sessions with artists and you don't have ultimate freedom, right? You, you have actually sometimes a fairly small leash, like, Hey, we want this, we want this thing, give us that blah, blah, blah. Um, and the chain smokers, I, you know, I got to give them a lot of credit. They totally opened the floodgates and said, if you think something should happen, make it happen. And at the end of the day, it's like, you know, vote by committee. If, if everyone likes the idea, we're going to use it. If they don't, then, then we won't. And so they gave me a lot of freedom to sort of expand creatively what I was able to do, you know, and then, and then beyond those creative roles, I also started to get into more business roles. Like, I started a publishing company. I started signing writers, including Candace Sosa, who's, you know, featured on a lot of the, uh, as a songwriter on a lot of the BTS stuff as well. Um, the plug-in business, um, some venture capital stuff. So I've, I've always been this way, I've, you know, and it's not going to stop. I'll continue to sort of evolve and I don't know where it's going to go, but it, it, I won't, if I'm in the same place I am now in five years, I would consider that a failure. So. Huh. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I think uh, one thing too, especially in the creative role, being well versed in so many different um, skill sets, it allows you to kind of help you envision the record, the end end result, a lot more too, right? Uh, yeah. Having a huge background in engineering, you kind of know. Hey, I mean, there's that term "mix as you go," right? And I've noticed that uh, you tend to do that a lot, especially when it even comes from the basic production ideas. So it's cool to have those kind of skill sets, and it helps you, I think, as a as a creative to build better taste, but not only that, just to kind of have a goal kind of mindset for, uh, for each of your projects that you work on. So that's yeah. cool, man. And uh, to be honest, a lot, and it even extends like for most of my career, for example, I was, went unmanaged. Mm. Um, all of the biggest hits, all of the biggest opportunities and things that people might um, recognize, you know, my name for, uh, that was all, I didn't have a manager or a team. It was all me. Um, I learned to, for example, read my own contracts because, you know, I, I felt that it was important to know so that if I didn't like something, I'd be able to have a conversation with a lawyer and have an educated conversation with a lawyer. So for, there was a period of years where I would mark up my own contracts. I'd read them. Hmm. In fact, what I did to learn it is I hired a lawyer to go through like the complexities of a contract. And I just learned all the things that I'm supposed to know, all the little things that labels throw in there that they're not supposed to put in there that you got to figure out. And then I, I just use that as like a, a class, basically use the lawyer as a teacher. And then I just started marking out my own contracts for, you know, all of the smaller things. If you're mixing one song or two songs, like nothing that, that is like, you know, too, um, that I could, I could mess up too easily. So, I just think it's, it's a good habit to be, if you're in business, if you're creative, like just to be curious and learn every side of it, even if you don't plan to do that side as your career, you're going to be interacting with these people on your team and you should have a good idea of how all the pieces work and how all the working parts move together um, so that you can ask the tough questions and you can make sure that you're being well represented by your team or well represented by the the um, collaborators that are around you and, and you know what you're talking about. Um, Cause there's a, I see a lot of creatives and I try to mentor as, as, as often as I can. Um, but I see a lot of creatives who are 
totally uninterested in the business part of music. Hmm. But the reality is it's called the music business for a reason. We, we, this is not a hobby anymore. We, we do this as, as a career. So learning every aspect of that, I think is key uh, and something I wish more songwriters and producers would do. And you wouldn't hear so many of those stories where people get, you know, screwed mm-hmm. or whatever. And we've all heard it and we've all probably been there too. So, um, yeah, the, the curiosity expends, uh, uh, extends well beyond just uh, creating uh, music. You know? at, at what point in your career uh, were you like, uh, or did you start working with the management? And the whole Last whatever, year. H- last year? First mm. time. Wow, really? Oh. I mean, that's, that's not entirely true. I've had a couple managers along the way, and none of them did more than me and so i said yeah. why well, like, like <laughs> i don't need you like i just don't yeah. need you. yeah I, you know I, i've worked uh like close to 30 years without a manager i still don't have a manager uh so you know fact, so you know you know but you can yeah. have a i bet you can have a conversation with any manager in the game and no and they're not going to be able to you know <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty curious though as to what a manager would bring to the table because I never work with one. So like uh, I've been meeting with a couple lately out here in LA and I'm like, I, I want to see, maybe try them out and see, see what they bring to the table, you know? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, <sighs> um, sometimes it's just uh, mentorship. Sometimes it's just, like someone who can sort of see from the 30,000, the bird's eye view Hmm. and, and just steer you in the right direction. If you're kind of getting off track a little bit, but other times it's some managers are doing a lot of heavy lifting. You know, some creatives have no interest in dealing with the business. The manager has to do touch and deal with everything. Um, That's never been, I'm a bit of a control freak. So that's never been my method. you know, but managers also help source work for you, help create opportunities. Oh, I want to release this song. Great. Let's set up the, the label over here. Like we can get this label to do a single deal for you, or, you know, this publisher will do, you know, your pub deal. Sometimes it's just, you know, the Rolodex and, and the experience that, that you're getting. So um, my, my feeling was I wanted to get the experience for myself. So I didn't always have to rely on someone else. Hmm. Um so that that was just my approach. You know, I read somewhere where um, some music expert was saying, like, for musicians to survive the the pandemic, you know, the types that survive the pandemic are the ones that know how to do everything. <laughs> and I think might be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. might be you true. Know, uh, mixing, you know, arranging, like, and you're like that. You do everything, even even like legal, uh, like paperwork right um uh, that's yeah. my weakness for me uh when i read papers like legal papers it's just forget it you know <laughs> like, yeah yeah that's something that's so out of my element but i mean i would love to be able to do that as well but you know um but in terms of creative of day, everybody's a little bit different some people are most comfortable when they're in their creative element um mm-hmm. i'm a really good multitasker i i don't require i've actually learned this through the plug-in business and some of the startup work that I do, um, some founders, some CEOs, some leaders um, are actually incapable of um, processing multiple, you know, columns uh, or, or verticals of, of their job at one time. Uh, some people need to, if they're focused on creative or let's say uh, some creative in marketing, right? And then they have to go and deal with the contract they need some separation. It might be a meal. It might be a break. It might be this, that, whatever, save it for the next day, but they need separation for, to give their brain time to process the first idea and move on to something totally different. I've actually gotten really good at, um, I can have five different conversations about five different things and think pretty quickly about all of them at once. And that was a skill that it it took actually a while to learn that. Um, and so now I don't get flustered very easily if like, you know, something's going wrong in the studio and I'm getting, you know, someone's yelling at me here in an email or my phone's blowing up and it's about something else that's important. I can, I'm usually quite good at juggling uh, multiple things at once. So, uh, but you know, sometimes you need a manager to take some of that weight uh, off your shoulders. Some creatives like just want to be creative and they, the, the act of even thinking about the business 
kills that creativity. And for those people, you need a, a manager who's going to do a lot of heavy lifting so that you can just keep your brain 100% of the time in that, that creative sort of like that zone, you know? For me, it's like, I just know that no one's going to want it more than me, you know? And if I oh. want to get something done, you know, there's no one's going to care to do it more right than me. And so I think at the end of the day, it's just like, you know, I, I rely on myself, but at the same time, just like you said, I think you said it really well, um, you know, it to kind of distribute, you know, the work so that you, you can do bigger things or, or to just uh, accomplish, um, you know, the bigger goals, because I think there's definitely power in number two. And, and you know, that's what we're doing with um, a lot of the things that, you know, we're building with this community and uh, with our publishing, because, you know, we it definitely does require a team. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's, 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 it's hard. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. definitely hard. Another thing I learned in the last few years is, is uh, I don't know if any of you guys have heard the term, like, know what you don't know. Mm. someone mm. used to tell that to me and i used to say are you stupid that makes no sense how do you know what you don't know and then it <laughs> took a while and i thought about it over the, it took a few years to really i mean i understood it but like to really understand it mm. um and to your point with respect to managers like or anybody on your team manager lawyer publisher doesn't matter sometimes it's just about having somebody in a position who has the experience to provide you that sort of mentorship or leadership in certain areas, right? You might have some person on your team who has a ton of experience in one area and you know that you don't have that. So you're going to have them around so that you're benefiting from their, they've already made all the mistakes. They've, they've learned the lessons you're benefiting from, from the lessons that they've learned over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and that's, you know, that's, that can be a very valuable thing, but you got to have that person who can really, you know, teach right. you things and whatever. And, and, um, I'm at Hallwood now and that's uh, Neil Jacobson, who's like a, a legend in, in the music business and, um, really, really smart guy. And he's somebody who, who, um, anytime I sit down with him, I'm going to learn something new mm -hmm. every time, uh, because of that wealth of experience that he has. Um, so that to me is important. That's valuable. Mm. Um, but you know, I, I always sort of encourage people in the beginning, like, just focus on you and anything that you think a manager is going to do for you in the beginning of your career. They're probably not. Right. Um, so you should just learn it for yourself yeah. and you might have that manager next year or the year after, but at least you've done the learning and now you can have a more intelligent conversation with your team and, and uh, yeah. And, and feel like you, you're, you're going to get somewhere and get a better result. You know, we'd love the content that you post where you share your experiences working with many different artists and their creative process. Is there like a signature DJ swivel trait that you believe sets you apart from others? Uh, for an example, like traits or skills that helped you advance in your career? I think there's a few qualities that I have that allowed me to sort of advance. Um, one is I never take no for an answer. I'm absolutely, if I want something done, I'm relentless. <laughs> I will not stop. Um, to, to me, it's, it's work ethic, right? Like when I used to work with Beyonce, um, she's an incredible singer. She's of course, beautiful. You know, when we think of a pop star, you think of, you know, a, a beautiful female artist or male artist or whatever. And, you know, they usually can sing, they can dance, they have all these skills and she has all of that. And she's like the best. You can argue she's the best in the game at, at all of those things. But her real superpower is her work ethic. Mm. It's not actually, cause there's a lot of people with great voices. Beyonce has a fantastic voice, but there's a lot of people out there with great voices, singers with great voices. Um, I'll take work ethic 10 out of 10 times over any skill that you can, um, or, or talent or gift, uh, that any artist or producer or creative has. Um, because you can't really teach the work ethic thing. Uh, somebody has to really figure that out for themselves and most people don't have it. So um, I was lucky that I got to work around people like my mentor Duro uh, works incredibly hard and he's very smart and I learned a ton from him. Then moving on to someone like Beyonce, I mean, she's just turns it up a notch. Like whatever level you think is the highest, she goes one, one or two past that. Um, and that was eye opening and, and, you know, gave me the opportunity to learn like what it really takes to be 
someone at that level. It doesn't just happen and then everything falls in your lap. I mean, she's a she's a beast. She really really works for, works at it. Um so I think you know having a, a insane work ethic paired with you know an unwillingness to accept failure, accept a no, a, uh, an extreme willingness to take risks. Uh, I take risks all the time. I you know invest in things. I try to. I'm always challenging myself because I I try to see what the potential opportunity is, and if I make good intelligent decisions along the way, I have a higher likelihood of getting there. So I take risks all the time. So it's this sort of confluence of, of things of, you know, working hard, you know, be willing to like go out on a limb and, and risk something and just being so persistent that um, no almost becomes like uh, out of your vocabulary, right? Even if you hear a no and you're like, write a song, you pitch it for that artist, they're like, no, it's like, okay, cool. Well, it's still a great song. So let me just find the next person who who will cut it or let me find some other way where I can monetize it. Right. Um, Sometimes a no is just an opportunity to sort of pivot mm. instead of like, you know, uh, just trying to beat your head on the same sort of <laughs> idea or door. I, I, I love that. I think, um, you know, rejection is always, it, it's part of it. In, in fact, it's your path to success. And, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's bound to happen. I remember when um, Carlos would tell me this all the time when I was a young little cowboy, um, that, you know, it's how you bounce back what sets you apart. And I love that kind of mentality that you have of just constantly just moving on. A no is just, as you said, just another way for you to just kind of pivot and move into a different direction. So that's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah. Or knock on a different door. I mean, whatever it takes, but, um, you know, having a thick skin in music, I think is key because we all probably, I mean, I think everyone here can agree. Like, I bet you hear no nine times for every one. Yes. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's what it feels like to me. I mean, I, I don't place every record I write or, or produce, like you're, you're placing a small percentage of them, 10%, less than 10%. I don't know, but it's not a lot. Right. Um, and so you have to be willing to accept that in, in a business like this, you know, I remember, you know, someone DMing me saying, Oh, you know, you guys, people like you never you know understand what failure is. Cause you guys, all you guys do is, you know, win awards and all and I was like, what, what in the world? Like, you know, that it was oh. crazy. Yeah. I mean, you know, but you know, I gotta say there's nothing worse than, um, being on or being surrounded by people that are just not like-minded. Like, for example, I, I was talking about this this morning. It's like playing on a basketball team and there is like a baseball player, a soccer player, you know, and, and then they're trying to play basketball with you, but they're not really the right people to win yeah. a game with you. And yeah. so, you know, I think in, th in that case, like you just got to, uh, really just kind of look and have the awareness to, you know, surround yourself with the right people too. Cause you know, sometimes you might not get the best advice. Sometimes you might not be surrounded by people um, that are playing exactly the same sport as you, you know? And so if you're losing and you're behind and everyone around you is not really playing the same game or they're talking or they're, they're not even paying attention. It's really hard to find that motivation. Right. So um, in a situation like that, I want to ask you, how would you, uh, kind of get yourself out of that situation, especially in a studio setting when there's a lot of creative minds and you're, you're realizing, Oh man, this is oh, not oh, okay. that's another loaded, loaded question. Cause okay. So how would I do it? I would just tell them directly, like you're not helping get out. Mm. Bye. <laughs> I don't, I, I've, I, I, I've gone to a place in life where it's like, I've learned that you can't please everyone. You can't make everyone happy. Yes. Um, I really believe that, your, I mean, it's such a cliche thing to say, but I totally believe it. Like your net worth is your network, right? Or your network is your net worth. I don't know which one comes first. <laughs> either way, essentially boil that down. All it's saying is, you know, if you hang around smart, successful people, I try to make sure that I'm the dumbest person in the room as often as possible. Yeah, um, I like feeling, uh, I like having conversations with people who make me feel stupid right? because that's a learning opportunity. Other mm -hmm. people hate those conversations because they feel stupid. Mm -hmm. um, so they want to surround themselves around people that make them feel better. Right. Um, and so I always just try to keep my focus on uh, whether it's friends or in business, in the studio, collaborators, whatever, 
having people around me who are bringing something to the table that I don't have, right. um, you know, to learn from and, and, and build off. So, uh, it's super important, you know, a hundred percent, you know, cause I was, I was, my answer to that was that, you know, no matter how badly you want to win, if you're not on the right team with, you know, the right people, especially like the supporting cast, you're not going to win, you know, at the end of the day. So yeah, I think so we can um, put up 50 and still lose. Right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Big so, yeah. <laughs> well said. <laughs> um, now we're going a little bit more into the technical side of things in your personal setup. What are the three most important things that you have to have in your session? Hmm. Uh, in my session. Okay. Three most important things. Um, from a gear standpoint, is that really, um, obviously a good pair of speakers cause that's translating everything that's happening in the, I mix in the box. So I don't really care about outboard gear. I'm of, of all engineers. I'm like the least gear focused you're ever going to meet. I actually think most gear is a waste of money hmm. and, um, is is a waste of money for most creators because they're buying it and it's not actually providing them what they think it's going to provide them. I find a lot of gear in music is purchased because of, uh, you know, a feeling of imposter syndrome, right? I'm not good. Oh, Max Martin has this. So if I get this, I'll be able to make a song as good as Max <laughs> Martin, which is insane. You know, um, you, Max Martin could work on the stingiest of setups and he would make a great record, not because he needs the gear, but because he has the ear. Mm. Um, so I always joke, like I'm, I'm not a gearhead, I'm an earhead. Um, but there are a few things you need. A good pair of speakers is like, that's the, the tires on the, on the car, right? Like mm -hmm. if that's not translating, you're not going anywhere. Mm. Um, so you need a good pair of speakers. Um, you know, I have my, uh, Pro Tools Carbon Interface, which I love. And uh -huh. um, I have a Neve Shelford channel, just a really nice channel strip, which I think is um, just helpful to get a good, good, uh, you know, vocal and, and things like that. So I'd say those are probably my my three most important pieces of gear. Yeah. Awesome. What about in terms of like vibe, just kind of setting up uh, your, I guess, your mental or your mindset or going to uh, before going into a session? Well. So going back to what I had said before, I'm, I'm, I'm very capable of, of um, having multiple different conversations thrown at me at any given time and being able to manage them kind of simultaneously. So what that means is part of that skill, if we sort of um, deduct out like what I'm talking about here is I don't really need anything to set up a vibe. I can kind of, mm. I don't, I don't need the time to sort of, set the mood. I just, I tell myself to, this is what we got to focus on. And then, you know, I'm, I, I'm not the most emotional person. I'm, I'm very analytical and logic focused and, you know, my brain is what's doing all of this. So why do I need to, you know, feel better about myself to get in the mood to want to write a song, like just get in the studio and start playing some ideas and hopefully something creative will happen. And, I mean, that's, that's the way it happens, right? That's, I think, the way that most magic happens. You guys, I, you know, I'm curious to get your thoughts on it, but all you guys make music. So, yeah. you know, that magic, like, you never know when it's where it's going to come from or how it's going to occur. So just getting in the room and doing it uh, is more important than, you know, trying to get mood lighting or something like that. I don't know, right. setting, lighting some incense or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think that's, oh, by the way, vibe can help. I'm not saying vibe vibe sure. can help, but it's just not, it's not a priority for me when I get in the studio. Sure. I, I mean, sure. I think the strangest thing I've seen, I don't know if I'm even allowed to say this, but uh, Will I Am used to have these like owls sitting on the speakers. <laughs> and I just think like that's like a, live owls or no, just, it was like, <laughs> it, no, that would have been, that would have been dope. But like, it would, it was just like these like owl figures and like, and he, he used to always like take them with for every session. And it, I, maybe he thought there was good luck behind there or whatnot. Little well, idiosyncrasies I, and stuff. Yeah, I'm yeah, honestly, yeah. I am the complete polar opposite of that. Like okay. I would never, sh no, I don't need anything. Just point. Where's the, where's the keyboard and mouse? Like, just let me go. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but it's funny. I heard a story years ago, the producer named seven Aurelius and I've worked with him a bunch and great guy. Love him. Haven't seen him in years, but 
fantastic guy, super talented producer, did a lot of the Ja Rule, Ashanti, like that Murder, Inc. era music. And I heard a story one time um, that he brought doves into the studio. Wow. Like actual, <laughs> actual doves. Yeah. And he had like prints photos up on the wall wow um if he ever sees this seven one hit me up and two i gotta know if that's a real story um <laughs> but he he was always a very eccentric yeah, producer yeah. um and i worked with him a, a bunch and and there was always like everything was about vibe everything was about mood everything was right. like i remember i did a session with him and we, we could we had in order to get the session going mm. well one sage got to sage the room uh, interesting okay. i remember one time i made the mistake of talking business after he saged the room <laughs> right so i showed up to engineer and was like hey so who do i talk to about handling my invoice right and he's like talk to me outside oh, man. Like, oh, i just saged the room you can't talk business after i sage the room in my head, I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I don't, I've never staged anything before. I don't know what that, what, what's on that. Can't talk business after you stage a room. So he had to re-sage the room. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but, but anyways, I'm, I'm not, I'm not making fun because some people need to right. create the, create the mood that they're going for. Right. So if you're trying to make a song that sounds like Prince, maybe you have to channel Prince. Right channel all the weirdness and all the the idiosyncrasies and the stuff that makes prince prince you got to channel that in order to sort of find that energy mm -hmm. i totally get it because yeah. i've worked with everybody and i'm just not that person i'm i can go into any room at any time and you know yeah if i'm having a bad day it might not be that i'm you know i might be in my head and not be able to get the most creative uh uh have the most creative day but right Oh, you don't know until you get in the room and just sit down and hear an idea or hear a drum loop or, or a keyboard thing. And, and does that spark a, another idea? Um, we had a question a while back. Someone said, you know, like, so do you write sad songs when you're sad? And I'm like, no, when I'm sad, I'm just sad, <laughs> you know, like, um, <laughs> but we have to write sad songs if that's the lead. I mean, that's, it's not what I, you know, always what I feel or what the vibe is at the moment, but you know, we, we just have this thing called deadlines, you know, and, um, and we have to perform at the highest level when, you know, those opportunities are given. So yeah. it's, it's interesting. Cause like, you know, I think people wonder like if artistically, yeah, sure. I mean, in an ideal world, like I would love to just write sad songs when I'm sad and happy songs when I'm happy, but you know, that's just not realistic, especially uh, from a professional standpoint. So, yeah. you know, but sometimes you do, sometimes you might go into the studio yep. and you had a you know rough day and you're like, you do want to write a sad song, yep. but then other times you're in the studio and you're actually having a great time, but you're, you're thinking back to that moment when, you know, it was tough. And that's the, that you're channeling that in, into the, the song. So yeah, there isn't really a, a true rhyme or reason. And what I've noticed, especially in these songwriting days, I've been hosting here. Um, everyone writes differently. Everyone has their own process and sometimes it overlaps and other times it doesn't. And um, everyone is super talented, certainly who, who I've been working with the last few days and they can all get to the same end result. Hmm. Um, but everyone has a different path on how they get there. And that's just the nature of music, right? There's an yeah. infinite number of possibilities and it's a matter of finding the one that works best for you where you get the best results. So sure. I think there's definitely something very important about what you said too, is that, you know, I think uh, for us, you know, we're constant. it's not just only in our studios that we're working, we're constantly working outside in different sessions, different studios, sometimes hotel rooms. Um, and it might not be the vibe that's set up for you, you know? And um, I think the fact that you kind of go into these sessions, just wanted, just having a goal oriented mindset definitely is something uh, to point out because um, not many people understand, especially if you're a gearhead, having to slug all those gears across the ocean is, is a very expensive and heavy process too. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, that's great uh, that you got a very goal oriented mindset. Yeah. Yep. The goal, the gear is only good as the person behind it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, just, just being able to channel different feelings, uh, you know, on a notice, right. Uh, that's something I think you could do when you're logical, right. 
Yeah, uh, you know, I think we talked about this on another, another episode uh, yeah. where, you know, if, when you're writing hundreds of songs for different clients, you know, you can't depend on your emotions for every song. Otherwise, you, you lose your mind, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and, and also, you're never going to be able to, or, or not never, but it's going to be incredibly difficult to do. At the end of the day, it's the music business. You're in there with a client. You're trying to deliver for a client or a pitch or something. Right. Um, it's not about how you feel. Mm-hmm. It's about how they feel. Yeah, They're the ones who are going to have to sing it. Mm-hmm. So um, if you're in a sad mood, but they want to write a party song, you better find a way to, to get into that. zone. <laughs> Otherwise you're, you're not going to be contributing a whole lot to that session. Are you? No. So party uh, with some tears, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tears in the club. So yeah. yeah. Awesome. Let's talk about your plugins. Um, my personal favorite is Noctonal. Uh, for me, Love it's that. like it's it's a super like all in one solution or like a channel strip for like my kicks and 808s. But you also have a great imaging, t- a stereo imaging tool, uh, distortion plugin, and even vocal processing plugin. What are uh, some of the stories behind designing your plugins? Yeah. So um, as I said earlier on the the podcast, I'm I'm a creative person, but I view myself as like. creative and 50% business minded. Hmm. Um, So I'm always exploring new business opportunities, ideas, things that want to, that I want to challenge myself with. And I usually ask myself two questions. Um, Now I ask myself three questions, but I, when I started this a few years ago, I asked myself two questions before I start anything new. Um, The first question is, does this new idea support what I'm already doing in music? So does it support my career as a creative, as a producer? Um, And then the inverse of that question, does uh, my career as a producer, songwriter, mixer, whatever, does that add value to the new thing that I'm doing Mm -hmm. in some way? And if I can answer yes to both those questions, then then that's a new business that I want to spend time uh, investing in. Um, the third and new question, and this was, uh, my manager, Neil Jacobson, he had me read a book. It's called essentialism. And it actually was quite useful. Um, because I'm, I have all these ideas and I want to do all these things. Sometimes I find myself spread a little too thin and I'm, I'm pulled in a bunch of different directions and it can, and it can be distracting and it's gotten worse over the years as I take on more. Um, so the third question is, is this necessary? Is this really at the core of what I want to be doing? Mm -hmm. It might be a good idea, but is it the most important idea that I can be focused on? That's a tougher question to answer. Um, So now if I can answer yes to those. So going back to the plugins, um, it was sort of the perfect storm. I wanted to, I love tech. I wanted to build a business that would outlast my creative career. And if we're all keeping it real, music is driven by 20 somethings, right? 30 somethings still are working, 40, 50. It doesn't matter how old you are. There's a lot of people who are still working into their later years. But the work that you are going to be recognized most often for is the work that you do in your 20s, because that is what's driving pop culture, mm. right? All the biggest hits are are largely made by, by young people now. Um, and obviously there's amazing producers like a Max Martin, like a Ryan Tedder, like a whatever who've been around and, but they're never going anywhere. They're always going to be here. Timberland, Swiss, Dre, whatever, Pharrell. Um, but the new, when styles change, when things evolve, it's usually because some 22 year old did something really dope. Hmm. Right. Um, and so I thought I'm in my mid thirties now at some point, I'm not going to be the guy who's getting the phone call anymore. I'm going to have to keep, I'm going to have to be chasing the guy who's getting the phone call or, or gal. Um, and so I thought plugins would be a, a great way to continue to contribute to a business that I love, continue to be creative in ways that I think are interesting and innovate in new ways and allow me to sort of push my boundaries. Um, but also contributes back to my career as a producer. And, and, you know, so my career as a producer helps sell plugins making plugins helps build my name even bigger as a, as a producer. So I felt like it was a smart thing to do. And to be honest, I've, there's a lot of things I've wanted to build. Like, Oh, I wish I had a plugin for this that would solve this problem for me. And it was never there. And so I started 
just building them myself. And it took a while to figure out and, and it took a few years to build the right team. And now that I've, I've, I've got a great team, like now we can kind of, you know, spit them out fairly, fairly quickly. Um, although I don't because everything I want to build is like the most challenging thing that I can <laughs> build at that moment. Like I haven't, I'm not building anything that's like too simple. Um, so we're working on a fifth plugin now. Uh, it's a channel strip and I'm convinced it'll be the, the best channel strip ever built. Wow. I know that's saying a lot because there's a lot of great ones out there, but um, the stuff that we've put into it, I think is going to be uh, incredibly valuable for a lot of uh, creators. It's like a creative uh, focus channel tr strip, basically. Wow. So, excited about that. Yeah, that's awesome. We had uh, Ken Lewis on our um, on our podcast a few episodes ago, and come to mind, he just dropped a plug into uh, greenhouse. Support that, love love that. Yeah, and it's awesome when you guys talk about these stories uh, behind the making of your plugins because it's all it it comes from like, hey, there's definitely some thing that could definitely help me out in my current uh, workflow or even production, and uh, kind of having that team behind it to really kind of make that happen is, is really cool story. Cause, um, yeah. yeah, especially nocturnal has been something that I've been using for a minute now and it's, it's been helping me a lot. You know, how, you know how that started was I was just using like pro Q two or pro, I think it was pro Q two at the time, fab filter one. And, um, I just was experimenting with like harmonics and just doing these narrow frequency boosts, but, tied to notes instead of frequencies. So tied mm -hmm. to like an A or a B or a C sharp or whatever. Um, and so I said, well, why don't we build one that gives you more control over it that would allow you to almost like retune your drums through EQ. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not meant, you know, it doesn't always have to be so obvious. Sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, subtly you have this like tight kick and you just want to boost, like, you know, you're working in the key of D, you want to boost the resonance around D and the, and the harmonics, the even and odd harmonics around D. Um, so you push that a little bit and now all of a sudden you're, you find your kick starts to glue to the track a little bit better. That was sort of the, the whole idea to it. How do we get, how do we redesign our samples around notes and keys and scales rather than frequencies? Hmm. Right. Well, that, that was sort of the concept behind it. Thanks for sharing that. I think here on Talk Back On, you know, we talked uh, about having something like the right attitude, understanding culture, embracing failure, bridging expectations. What are some practical ways that our viewers can prepare for entering overseas markets like K-pop? With K-pop, I, I think the biggest thing is just being open-minded. Um, I don't know how you guys, I, I actually want to ask this question to you because I had this debate uh, the other day, like, when I think of K-pop, I don't actually think of it as a genre of music per se. And nobody kill me here. Um, I'm going somewhere with this. And I'll use BTS as the example. BTS, it, they make pop music. Mm -hmm. Just because it's in Korean, it doesn't matter. It's still pop, right? And they explore a lot of different genres. BTS has done slow ballads. They've done big anthemic, like, you know, alt rock uh, ballad -y stuff. They've done up-tempo dance records. They've done hip hop records. They've done Latin inspired, uh, records. I, I don't know what is the defining thing that makes K-pop K-pop other than the fact that it's Korean pop music. Um, but when I think of BTS, I don't think of a K-pop group. I think they are a global pop group. It, it just comes down to good music and bad music, you know, and, yeah. and BTS is just incredible music. Adding that label like K-pop almost feels like you're, you're doing a disservice Yes. to me. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's no, it's no disrespect to K-pop. It's just like, why do you have to add the, mm -hmm. why do you have to make it more narrow? Right. There's nothing other than the fact that it's in most of it or a lot of it is in, in the Korean language you know, like what is the identifying thing factor that makes it K-pop as opposed to pop? I don't have a good answer for that. I, if you guys have an answer, I'd love to hear it. But um, <laughs> ultimately they make pop records and whether, you know, put them up, you know, and this is not a comparison, but like any other 
Justin Bieber, One Direction, uh, Billie Eilish, or whatever. Everybody, they're all making pop records. They all have their own style, their own patina, their own aesthetic. But ultimately, they're making popular music for the world. So, um, you know, I, sometimes I think that the K-pop term is is almost taking away from and limiting, um, right? but not but not, yeah, to, not to disrespect the genre. Like obviously, there's some amazing, you know. But uh, you know, I don't know. Is, is there something in K-pop that makes it? k-pop other than the language well i th- i think when when the term k-pop was born i don't think anybody was expecting it to be this big right to be honest uh i think i think you know k-pop sort of uh outgrew its name really yeah you know, now it's at a point where you know uh you know the members are not even korean anymore right so we have multi-cultural uh, members uh you know and multicultural writers yeah, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the songs are being written by non-Korean writers, obviously. Uh, so yeah. it's it's grown to a much bigger thing than just K-pop. And I think, um, you know, to sort of explain what I guess the original K-pop was, you know, I mean, it's obviously evolved a lot till yeah. now. Yeah. But I mean, there there were some elements of Korean, what we used to call like traditional, uh, like trot music kind of, you know, elements that were kind of infused into uh, like Western pop sound, right? So to me, uh, I just felt like, you know, working f- even from the 90s on, it was kind of like Korea's attempt to make Western music and it just kind of ended up being something else because it's just, you know, culturally, uh, you know, people are different, right? So it ended up in, in another place where that turned into sort of this new K-pop genre. But right now, uh, that, genre is just so grayed out because it's just gotten so much bigger um you know when, and it's when a group like bts is being nominated for grammys topping the billboard charts in america um having number one records you know mm-hmm. having radio airplay that is not in the k-pop genre at the grammys there it's in the pop genre or the yeah. general genre or whatever so like you know, um, I, I say that with an immense amount of reverence and and respect for the genre, for the style, for the culture. Um, you know, it, it's not a knock on K-pop. I just think it's pop music. Right. Any way you want to look at it, you know. I think BTS is uh, in a category of their own. All right. So when it comes to the genre name, right, K-pop, I think the biggest factor is like, the genre listing on like Apple Music or Spotify, for example, right? So um, maybe for BTS, putting the K-pop label m- might limit them. But for other artists, that's not BTS's scale. You know, it's to their advantage to be in a smaller genre to actually be right, charted, right? right? Yeah. So if they if they join the U.S. pop charts with everybody else, you know, they might just get buried. So uh, yeah. there's advantages on both sides. Uh, no, that's that's a very good point. Um, but you know. It, it it takes a group like BTS to pave the way so that the next group can be even bigger, right? Yeah. Um, and I think the amazing thing uh, is they have taken over Western music in such a significant way that now you have people who never would have listened to Korean music who are sitting and learning Korean language so that they can understand the lyrics better. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that is something unique that, you know, the Western, Western music, the Western, like, you know, Psy was, was big for a moment and that, but that felt meme and like, it was, it was super popular and everyone paid attention to it, but it was like the song was popular or the video was popular and the aesthetic and everyone was like, this is so cool, whatever. But it, they, I don't think the average Western listener cared about Psy as a, as a, as as an, as a person. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a a disrespectful way, just like your favorite artists, your favorite groups. It's not just the music you care about. You care about them as people. Right. You care about what they're doing. You want to know what they ate that day, what kind of clothes they're wearing, what their fashion is, what their thoughts on, you know, this, you know, political thing is, whatever. You care about their thoughts and their feelings as a human being. And BTS opened the door to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and my hope is that that's going to leave the door open for more groups uh, who 
are in their position or were in their their position from years ago, um, you know, to be able to make records and appeal to not just the Korean audience, but a truly global audience. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think kind of that's the opportunity that is sort of presented for every new K-pop artist group, whether you're solo or whatever. Now you have people who care about the culture. So now let's, let's make music that, that, um, that can sort of cross all these lines. Right. Yeah. I just want to add to that too. Cause you know, a while back, I think it was like on clubhouse, which I think clubhouse is like pretty dead now, <laughs> but pretty now yeah. the best way to kind of, uh, explain that I think was the analogy I gave about blues music. You know, someone overseas in Asia or in Korea, you know, they might be able to replicate blues, but if they, they if they don't really study and understand where blues comes from, they they might not be able to express the pain behind blues, right? And and I feel like, um, you know, a lot of that soul element is something that keeps K-pop what it is. And so you see a lot of the the natives, they might see, uh, and you know, many people don't know this but you know the natives they they don't necessarily like a lot of the songs that are geared more towards the western pop charts um those songs actually don't do well in korea um but in more the in the english language ones like a dynamite or butter or something like right. that yeah and, and um some of the the groups that are actually doing really well in the states that are from k-pop aren't necessarily selling records in korea um oh, and so okay. yeah it's it's actually very interesting and and um you know for the labels to be happy, especially because, you know, they want to sell not just the records, but brands, you know, partnerships and all those things out in Korea. Um, they have to make, you know, they have to appeal to that as well. So it has to be a very definite plan moving overseas. And, you know, for um, the, just like how you mentioned uh, with BTS, they're a global group. You know, they're definitely not, you know, they shouldn't be kind of in the mix with K-pop. Uh, but like, you know, what Jae Hyung said, I think with everything that's happening in Korea, they still have to maintain and, you know, and protect the soul element that's behind K-pop as well, which ultimately makes it K-pop. Yeah. And well, also I think BTS have become like the ambass, the global ambassadors for all things, Korea and Korean right. culture. At least that's how the outside views it. I'm not sure how, you know, local, you know, actual Koreans view that, mm. but certainly, I mean, the interest in in Korea and Korean culture, what BTS has done for um, you know tourism and things like like it, it it's it's meaningful. It's right. meaningful on a global level. We're talking billions and billions and billions yeah. of dollars of of commerce because of how they've been able to sort of shine a spotlight on mm-hmm. on on this amazing place. So, um, but putting them in a different category almost feels maybe a little bit un- unfair to them because like what? So they've, they've out outgrown K-pop. So they have to be something else. I mean, maybe mm-hmm. they've, they're just sitting on the throne of K-pop and right. you know, somebody, somebody else has to come and take them off. And that's what you, now you're challenging new groups and new artists to like, to, to make better music or create a, you know, more better videos and styling and all. I mean, K-pop is also so much more than just music. Yes. It's like right. the aesthetic of everything, the videos, the packaging. Like I've been saying for years, the Western market can learn a lot mm. about uh, how to package and sell a product Market. from Korea because we don't have a physical uh, have physical records. Right? There's no physical records in the U.S. anymore. I mean, the, the odd like collector will go and buy some vinyl or something like that, but nobody's buying packages. But with k-pop right there the the code has been cracked somehow and mm-hmm. all of these you know some of these artists that i work with like twice has sent me a record and bts sent me a record and you know the, i mean the packaging is beautiful the i'm never going to listen to the cd i don't even have a cd player anymore <laughs> but like you get the stickers and the the polaroids and all the photos and all and the posters and all the little things and it it's they've created new ways of, of creating value Right. Um, you know, toward the music. And I think, you know, don't, don't put them in, in this, like, take them out of K-pop, just say, you know, they have crossed over, but also they are still Kings of their castle. If mm-hmm. that, yeah. At least that's how I view it. I don't, maybe internally it's They're definitely it's, Kings on both sides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Facts. Yeah. And yeah, we see these definitely became uh, more of the merchandise category now. Right. So 
you know, most kids don't have CD players. We don't even have CD players and we're, you know, yeah. studio, studio uh, engineers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but there's so, also a thing to say about the co collecting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, collecting. I mean, just the whole fandom culture and everything. Yeah. And when, you know, in, in the in the late 90s to the 2000s, where, you know, like America was sort of scaling back their budgets for music videos and everything else. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and all of a sudden K-pop is spending like Michael Jackson budgets. Right. <laughs> in, in the current yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, so like. Yeah, I think I think when uh, people see the content, they know it's uh, you know, there's a lot of money vested into these contents and you know there's a lot of uh sort of passion pushing it forward right so yeah. people are really getting into it and you know the way they sort of uh cultivate the fandom and you know the community and you know this now it's sort of like if you like k-pop is it it's not just about liking one group it's like being part of a community right so like yeah. you know it's like you know there's that the the japanese anime community where you know they have conventions and you know thousands of kids from all over the world come you know dressed up as you know anime characters anime characters and, or, yeah, and, and, and the all the stuff tank. there's a whole subculture there and now keep is becoming sort of that thing where it's you know it's a community where people like young uh, fans feel like a sense of belonging hmm. and it's you the know? most global community in my opinion yes and i use like Twitter is my sort of uh, barometer for this, but the in the engagement that I get from anything related to BTS is so above and beyond what any. It doesn't matter if I'm talking about Beyonce or any of the big artists I've worked with here. Like it's it's so different the reaction to you know from the fans, and I I think that has to do with not just caring about the artist, but like you said, you, you're caring about every aspect of, of the, of the creativity there. You're buying all the merch, you're going to all the shows, you're buying the online tickets, you're streaming the music, you're, you know, in fan clubs or, or in Reddit forums talking about the lyrics and what they mean to you. And, you know, also, you know, I find there's a lot of like, um, I kind of, Maybe it's just BTS. I don't know if every K-pop group is like this, but I almost like uh, would create a parallel between like the MCU. I'm a big like comic book MCU nerd. Um, mm -hmm. And so like the way that they tie um, uh, in the MCU, like tie characters and stories across multiple films into this long intertwining thing is kind of similar to how BTS has treated their music. There's like, narratives that span across albums and 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 eras um like uh what was the song i worked on one song it was i'm fine but then there was a counter to that was was it save me do you guys know or am i getting into too far into the weeds here <laughs> uh with, with bts the, i worked on the record i'm i'm fine but there was another song save me which was sort of like use this a similar sample if i i, I think i'm if I'm wrong here, forgive me, but I'm pretty sure it's these two songs. And like it uses the sample from one song appears in the sample to another and the lyrics are related and but they're on separate albums. Like there's almost like a, it feels like you're in a comic book and you have to learn every aspect and, you know, yeah. uh, it, it just creates more engagement, more commerce. And I, I wish more uh, Western artists would take that type of time to craft a project and 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 put their songs and ideas together and 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 you know build the narrative outside of just the music but also the merch and all the other things that that k-pop does and i think that's a byproduct of just the nature of the difference in the business mm -hmm. the music business in in the u.s and and the western world is like you sign an artist but the artist is they're still their own entity they're still their own thing you happen to have a business relationship on the album um but the artist is is who they are and they're going to make their own decisions and roll out things the way that they want and do it the way they they want it's more collaborative with the label whereas in k-pop it's really the labels kind of able to you know control every aspect of the creative uh you know even if the even if the artists are writing and, and part of the creative there's still someone above above that making sure that is everything coalescing in a way that tells the story that we want to tell uh you know and that may never be able to happen in the western music business right just by the nature of the difference in the business model
Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even uh, amongst creators, right? Like, um, you know, f- here we go to Nam, and and you know, people know each other, recognize each other, and you know, we we uh, you know respect each other's work. We kind of express that here. Like, you go to oh, or for K-pop, you could go to an event like KCON, and all the fans know you know the people behind the songs. Um, you know, and I've I've been approached by you know different number of fans just talking about the music that I've written or produced, and you know, it's just this interactive energy you know like we're all just talking and and um being able to just really kind of coexist um and i think that's a really cool thing about just how k-pop is expanding and growing for sure yeah they they care they care and right. and there's like almost i think once we sort of really fully adopted streaming over here mm-hmm. like music became uh disposable mm-hmm. Because there's always there's a new song next week and a new song the week after it became disposable. Right. So, um, what K-pop's done really well is make music not disposable, make it really valuable. Absolutely. Actually, the music and and all of the creativity that surrounds the music it's it's a valuable cultural thing. And with streaming, we don't really treat it like that anymore. Mm-hmm. With Western artists, we don't treat it like that anymore. We kind of just say, well this is the hit for this week and next week you get something new right. and then people move on to the next song. And maybe that instant re- gratification of streaming, this is sort of a byproduct of that. It trains people to just like look for the next thing. Right. right? Okay. So K-pop's done a tremendous job at avoiding that type of uh, consumerism mm-hmm. uh, for something and making it still more art driven. Does that make sense? Sure. Uh, yeah. At least that's what I noticed. No. Wow, awesome. Do you have any advice for the aspiring producers and songwriters in the industry that possibly want to become the next DJ Sobel? Sure. Um, I mean, there's so many different things that, that I can say. I, I sort of sum my career up in a f- with a few different traits. Like, one is when you're starting out, like, be prepared to provide value. Mm-hmm. For me, that was an unpaid internship. And I worked literally three years unpaid. And I know that sounds insane. I was juggling like some paid work and like, but I was still interning during the day, you know, eight hours a day or more unpaid. Um, That's the best way of providing value. You cost nothing. If you make a mistake, people will accept it and say, oh, you're learning. It's all good. As soon as you start getting paid, if you make a mistake and it's bad enough, you stop being paid. Mm. You get fired. So when you're an intern, it, it, it's actually, a, I wish more students would embrace this. And it's tough, like things are getting expensive, inflation, life's hard, I get it, everyone, you know, work, you gotta, you know, get your value. But when you're trying to achieve greatness in something like music, it's a hard business to win at. There's so many people who wanna be in it, very few who wanna put in the work to be the best at it. Um, and so I always say just, if when you're starting out, be as valuable, create as much value for whoever you're working for, wherever you're at or whatever you're facing as possible. Take the unpaid internship, use it as education. It's free school. They charge you to go to school. You can get a free, free job. Yeah. You got to do a little bit of work, but you get a great education from it. Um, then, like I said earlier in, in the podcast, like you got to take risks. Sometimes if you believe in something, you have to go after it. Um, what is the quote? Uh, uh, not every uh, crazy idea is great, um, but every great idea is crazy. Is that, did I butcher that? I think that's it. <laughs> um, that was pretty right. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, basically I, I say that to say like, sometimes if you believe in what you're doing and you believe in yourself and everyone else around you is saying, no, nah, you can't do it. It's too hard. That's never going to work. Blah, blah, blah. Like you got to put yourself around people who are going to, you know, lift you up and, and support those crazy ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think those are, those are two skills or two qualities that I, I think are, are good lessons. And, and maybe a third one is when I started, I said yes to literally everything. It didn't matter if it was mix this song for $20 or it, it didn't matter what it was. I, I literally just said yes to everything. And what it did is it allowed me to um, meet way more people, 
network more, build relationships. Generally speaking, when you say yes to everything, it means even the things that you feel are below you or, or beneath you or not enough value for you. When you're starting out, say yes to it. Doesn't matter because you're not you're not in this. Yes, everyone's in business to make money eventually, but the creatives who who last love making records. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't be so worried about money right away. Focus on meeting as many people as you can, making as much content, creating as much as you can. Um, and then you notice things just start to happen for you. They just like, you know, you guys know you've all done it. Like you work on this project and then you get a call from the producer on that project. And then you work on another project and the A&R you worked with liked the work you did. And so they call you for another project and, you know, that's kind of how everything goes. So the more rooms you put yourself in, the more people you meet, the more things you say yes to creates more opportunities for you to be called back. And when they call you back, you did a good job. Now, now you can, you know, raise your rate a little bit. So I'd say those are probably the three most important things looking back. You know, if I had to add a fourth, I'd say, put your music out. Mm. So we're, we're producers. We, we write songs all the time. Yep. How often are those songs you write them and then they sit on a hard drive and they never see the light of day like yeah. most of the time. And so I'm, this is a lesson that it took me 15 or 17 years to learn now. Uh, but they shouldn't just sit on your hard drive, find a way to, to do something with them. Whether you put it out as an artist thing, you license it for sync music, whatever, like, you know, put, get your stuff out there, put it out. Even if it's unpaid, like you never know what's going to happen once it goes online. So and there's no excuse now with all the platforms out there. You know? Yeah, I'm, you can get it. You can instantly distribute your music in five minutes for very little money. Fifteen years ago, to get distribution, <laughs> you like it, no. it wasn't easy. You had to like go to BMG and say, "Hey, like we're gonna do a whole rollout. We're gonna make sixty thousand CDs." Like, yeah. what? <laughs> now you just upload it. It's great. It's easy. Right. And it, and if you don't sell them, they'll send them back to you. And charge you for shipping. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So a garage um, full of CDs, you know. <laughs> exactly. So hopefully, there, those are a few. Those are probably the, the ones that I would deem most important at, at, for young producers. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Amazing. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, anything you would like to plug? Any future? Uh, I know you mentioned your plugin, but your social media, your uh, your website, etc. Uh, yeah. Releases. Yeah, people can check me out, djswivel.com. Uh, the plugins are there. You know, my work stuff is there. Um, the, at DJ Swivel on pretty much all social media, Instagram, Twitter. I don't really use Facebook, but you can find me there if you want to. TikTok. Um, yeah, and is there anything I'm plugging? Nah, not really. Just kind of, I'm in like this, uh, uh, the pandemic, if I'm keeping it real, was um, incredibly uncreative for me. Um, I hated, I actually really hated making music during the pandemic. It was driving me insane. Mm. Um, and just in the last like few months I've now moved and whatever, and I've refound that passion and love for the creative process. Uh, and so right now I'm kind of just in a, a, a building phase of just getting back in and just writing with everybody and saying yes to every session and just doing everything um, just to get back in, just to keep myself in that creative zone where ideas are constantly flowing. And so, um, yeah, but if, uh, if there's something new to plug, I'll, I'll let you know down the line. We'll come, but we'll do that. <laughs> Sounds uh, good. Yeah. Kairos, uh, Jay, would you like to plug anything? Oh, well, my usual, uh, uh, social media at I am Jay Chong. <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, we, yeah, we just had a, re a recent release with uh, Nick Chow in Taiwan with his mom, Billy. Uh, I think it's like charting number one or something out there now. Right. So right. go check that out. Um, yeah, uh, that's about it for now. Yeah. Um, the Real Kairos is uh, my handle um, for pretty much, I think, everything social media. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're staying really busy with our publishing um yeah I, I think we're gonna start we're gonna try start uh meeting people outside the virtual setting you know and hopefully we can do more camps um you know that's one of the reasons why i met up with some of the labels today because i think we're gonna start um you know i don't know if we're gonna start flying out to all the you know labels just yet but um you know we're gonna do our best to 
you know, do a lot of the in-person sessions now. And um, kind of like what DJ Swivel was saying, you know, I feel like the past few years have been really tough, you know, finding inspiration. But, you know, we managed uh, somehow, like we adjusted through this pandemic and, uh, you know, found ways to do it on, on, on Zoom. But, um, but yeah, I think, you know, things are going to change soon. At least, you know, that's the the vibe I get, you know, and I feel like a lot of people are just ready. They're just primed and ready to go. So for the ones that are ready, you know, uh, um, I think just this, this episode was so good because I feel like, you know, there's a, there's this idea or this perspective where you just sit on ideas and you go, man, I wish, I hope, but if you're not ready, then, you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to happen and say, yes, I think that's such a great, you know, idea or concept. Um, because right now, like, especially what we all went through, it's like, what better time to fail, you know, and, and just figure things out, you know, and I feel like this is such a great time for us to, you know, just find new, you know, even just, uh, um, you know, just new talent and new things that we can offer, especially just with all the resources that are available online and uh, podcasts, just like uh, Talk Back On podcast. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's just a great time for us to be creative. And, you know, what we are doing with Decade Plus Music is, is just that, you know, we're um, really, you know, helping uh, with a lot of the publishing, but also, you know, helping uh, to expand and inspire others creative, creatively. So, yeah. Well, we, we got a link. We got to write something. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I work on some tracks. It happen. We'll, we'll do it live on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. But man, seriously though, today, uh, I, th- I think it was like one of the first episodes where I, it was really insightful, man. Like, uh, yeah, I think absolutely. it was like the, probably the most realistic sort of, uh, mm-hmm. answers to every question. Uh, it was, it was really great. Well, I, I, always try to keep it real so <laughs> yeah i learned it a lot Sometimes you, you say something you think it's gonna sound i just i just speak my mind and yeah one thing to take away here guys there's no substitute for hard work so i hope you guys enjoy this episode stay humble stay busy and definitely look out for one another we'll see you guys next time bye <laughs>